Maybe we'll um, get started. We'll be Shirley and uh, people can be joining yeah. us. The, the curve is starting to flattening off with the number of people coming in. <laughs> okay, so um, good evening, everyone. Um, just uh, welcome to this evening's webinar, all about the Monaghan Wetland Action Plan, which is currently in development. Um, thanks to Shirley Clerken and MPWS for funding it. And uh, this evening's just a chance to get some feedback on what we're on what we're doing in the developing the action plan, and also for us to kind of uh, put information out there about the fantastic resource of wetlands we have up in County Monaghan and why we value them or why we should value them. And particularly, we'd love to get feedback from yourselves later on. So we do have a bit of a feedback session so towards the end. So to kick the evening off, I'd just like to welcome Shirley Clerken, Heritage Officer at Monaghan County Council. Shirley obviously has been promoting wetlands in Monaghan for a long time. Um, from, I suppose, 2006, she would have got her first wetland surveys done up there. So since then, she's been doing all kinds of things to do with wetlands. So Shirley, maybe you'll uh, take control of the screen there and give us a welcome. Okay, I think I'm sharing. I hope, at least I hope I'm sharing. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks, Paddy. Um, I'm delighted uh, to be here this evening and hi everybody um, on Zoom and thanks a million for joining us here. Um, so my name is Shirley Clacken and I'm the Heritage Officer with Monaghan County Council and I'm one of the many Heritage Officers that are around the country. There's one in most local authorities. Uh, it's a programme that's funded by the Heritage Council in conjunction with the local authorities and it's really on the go this last 20 years or so. And uh, we work both on built cultural and natural heritage. And um, we run, uh, we have county um, heritage plans and we run various projects and programs every year. Um, so I'm just gonna give a quick run through just so you have an understanding when it comes to the more substantive pieces of information that uh, Peter and uh, Mary Catherine and Rory will present how we got as far as here uh, over the last 15 years. So that's why my title of my presentation is Morning Wetland Action Plan. How did we get here? So I'll actually put it into slideshow so that it's larger for you. I think it might be easier from the beginning. Um, okay, so. So in as like with all the other um, heritage officers, the first thing really that um, any heritage officer does when they go to a local area or to a county is to start to look at what baseline information is out there with regard to natural, cultural and built heritage. Um, and like that, for Monaghan, we did loads of public consultation in the year 2005. And one of the big issues that came up over and over and over again was this um, information that wetlands were being infilled and drained throughout the country or throughout the county. But when we delved into it, we'd actually no information hardly at all on the extent of the wetland resource for County Monaghan at that stage. There was a very short list of um, areas of scientific interest that had been done by First Furbaha uh, way back in the day, and um, it hadn't really been updated since that time. Even the more recent NHAs had just reused that information and hadn't really um, found any new sites or anything like that. But we were very concerned with this idea that there seemed to be a lot of observations coming from members of the public that a lot of wetland infilling was happening. So we did a survey to try and get a handle on that finding. And what we found was at that stage, looking at aerial photography and doing surveys on 13 kilometer squares, was that there had been a 10% loss within those six years from 2000 to 2006 of the wetland resource in Monaghan, which was a very, very um, worrying fact at that stage. Now, obviously we were in the height of the, pub or the Celtic tiger, if you recall it, but still it was a very, stark fact and that propelled us on to try to do a lot more work in this area and through the heritage plan that we developed over the next number of years. So following on from that then we kept sort of just trying to get a handle on really what we had and what was happening. So we collected a lot more information, we did some FEN surveys um, in 2007 and 2008 and we discovered that in fact Monaghan was a great county for the different FEN types of habitats per FEN and transition mire the habitats that people didn't really realize were good up here and that we had this fantastic resource and then we started looking at the dragonflies and the damselflies that are particularly occurring on these small wetland sites on these small lakes and looking at the water beetles assemblages is also within that discovering with a lot of rare species lesser recorded species and endangered species right across our resource and within those surveys um we also looked at what was threatening the wetlands and the surveyors and actually 
it was actually Peter Foss and Patrick Crushell that got those very first surveys, um, those contracts for those surveys after we had the initial one done by um, Beck Consultants, that we're discovering so many threats um, that were happening on these sites. And so we started doing a lot more building capacity and awareness raising in conjunction with all of this collecting information at the same time, sending information to the National Parks and Wildlife about sites that we consider to be of high conservation value um, and trying to work very much in partnership with them to trying to help them help us um, conserve these sites. So we did a lot of awareness raising during those years as well. So we did booklets on the wetland types, different habitat types right across the county. We did waste and wetland leaflets. And this is long before the wetland legislation changed to be better. You know, in 2011, the wetland legislation changed for planning and for agricultural regulations. But really before that, it was very, very poor. So we were trying really to use um, um, persuasion, I suppose, and to get people to understand that wetlands weren't just bog holes is what they were being called at that stage, really areas that you could just dump stuff in. And we held a number of conferences on the wise use of wetlands, trying to promote the Ramsar uh, concepts of, you know, living sustainably, the sustainable development idea with wetlands and the different natural capital assets that wetlands were. Um, we've done numerous workshops with councillors, with staff, with local community. And then we produced a book um, two years ago um, on natural and cultural exploration, which is available in all the shops in Monaghan and available through our office. And at the same time, we were trying to build and to do sort of more substantial conservation projects to see if the council could deliver conservation, as well as just, you know, collect information on it and sort of try to raise awareness. Um, so we got involved with a project in action, the Action for Biodiversity Interreg project. Um, way back in 2008 I think it was and um, for that project we did a lot of wetland actions and um, different types of I suppose awareness raising adverts on the radio about the values of wetlands and just trying to build more capacity really right across the east border region and then much more recently um, in gosh the years are flying away from me now I can't even remember the year but four years ago um, we got involved with the collaboration for the Natura Network Interreg project, and that really focuses in on wetland habitats. And even before that project came on board, we were we were lobbying the whole time to make sure that that program, that funding program, included wetland habitats because we knew how risk at risk they were. So those were are working with a numerous, uh, lots and lots of partners, building on our work all the time through collaboration. And likewise, the Fence Survey National Methodology that was done through our project in Monaghan with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. And the wise use of wetlands was done with the international um, convention. They actually came to Monaghan in 2015. And um, the director general of the Ramsar Convention was in the Bally Bay Wetland Center doing the chair address or one of the main addresses, the keynote address for that conference. And we did that in partnership with the Irish Wetlands Ramsar Committee. So just really trying to build up a small resource that we have in the local authority to try to work with others um, to really um, improve the future for this natural capital asset that we have in the county. And then more recently, we've done a new um, biodiversity and heritage strategic plan, which has very much at the heart of it, the idea that all of our habitats contribute to heritage and, and they contribute to biodiversity and climate change mitigation and adaptation, and that functioning ecosystems are absolutely fundamental if we are to address climate change if we were to address sustainable living and sustainable livelihoods right across the county and that their ecosystem services really really must be must be conserved and restored so we have 13 themes on our new heritage and biodiversity strategic plan and the second one of those is all about wetlands which is how we got to the place where we are now and we also have another very few important ones relevant to this topic which would be climate change mitigation and adaptation Pedros and native woodlands, which of course often the two habitats completely interact, and also then of course high nature value farmland as well. So our Monaghan wetlands or our Monaghan's wonderful wetlands theme then is all about recognizing that there's the continued decline of these habitat types nationally and that they are very important for biodiversity and climate change and that we want to build on the work that we've done with regard to surveying, mapping, public awareness and conservation work. And even now, I think we will change that word more and more to restoration is where we're at, really. And we need to restore, actually, the habitats um, and conservation is no longer really enough. So this is how we got to where we are now. 
Um, luckily, the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage have reinstated uh, the Biodiversity National Plan Action Plan funding, which is run out through the National Parks and Wildlife Service. And we've been able to get some funding from that fund for last year and this year to work on this plan, which is to try to really develop further the idea that local authorities can deliver for um, bio, biodiversity conservation and restoration, and specifically in Monaghan, our key habitats of wetlands. Um, but how can you do that? And how can we really effectively deliver it, prove that we're delivering it, show that we're delivering value for money, and cost it for our funders? So that's really how we got to the position um, where we're at today, which um, Mary Catherine and Peter will explain much more detail about the project, but that's how we got there. So um, thank you very much. And that's our email address. And I look forward to the discussion at the end. Great stuff, Grace. Uh, thanks very much, Shirley. Um, so uh, next up is Mary Catherine. Just to uh, highlight, if, if anyone has any questions or anything during the presentations, just pop them in there into the questions and answers or into the chat, whichever we can pick them up in either place. And uh, we might have a question, uh, a bit of a session at the very end, just have a bit of an open discussion. So if you can just hold your questions till then. Um, okay, next up is Mary Catherine Gallagher. Mary Catherine's working as an ecologist with Wetland Surveys Ireland. She's been on the team for the last uh, three years at this stage, I think. Uh, before that, she did her PhD in marine ecology, but uh, at the moment she's doing an awful lot of varied kind of work in all kinds of ecological assessment and wetlands and mapping and everything else. So Mary Catherine, I'll hand over to you to tell us all about the value of wetlands and why we should be thinking about conserving them. Thank you. Thank you. And just to say as well uh, that this is being recorded just to make people aware, just in case. Forgot that, yeah. Um, so can everyone see? Perfect. So yeah, my talk this evening is um, about why wetlands are important. So just before I dive into it, I think it's important that we all have the same understanding of the word wetlands and what we're talking about. So what is a wetland? And as the name suggests, it's a wet place. So it can be somewhere that's wet for the whole year, somewhere that's just wet seasonally, and usually the water table is at or near the surface. And you find wetlands all over the world and they include some sort of more unusual or kind of tropical habitats, things like mangroves, um, oases in deserts, rice paddies. Um, but here in Ireland, some of our more typical wetland habitats are things like lakes, bogs, fens, uh, turlocks, wet grasslands, wet woodlands. So we have a really wide variety, a diversity of wetland habitats in Ireland. And as you can imagine, if you're a plant or an animal living in a wetland habitat, it's kind of a difficult enough place to live. You have to be able to cope with being wet all the time, living in water. You have to cope with sometimes being, um, you know, trying to cope with low levels of oxygen, trying to cope with low nutrient levels. So I'm just going to give a few of the kind of more interesting examples of how some of the wetland plants are adapted to living in their environment. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the bulrushes over here on the left. So their roots are, are underwater, they're, um, you know, rooted down below the water and it can be quite difficult for them to get oxygen when they're under the water like that. So what these bulrushes have done is they've grown up, the, they've got their leaves up out in the air and they've got these special air spaces in their leaves. And that makes it way easier for them to get oxygen from the air, which they then send down to their roots that are underwater. The water starwort, the one in the middle, top middle, has also adapted to help it get more oxygen, this time from the water. It's got loads of really small, thin leaves, so it's just increased the surface area that it can absorb oxygen from the water. So that's a pretty smart one as well. And then the water lily has a, a cool adaptation, and this time it's to help with photosynthesis. So all plants obviously need to photosynthesize, and to do that they need sunlight to hit their leaves. Um, but if your leaves are underwater, you can imagine it's quite difficult for the sunlight to actually reach the leaves properly. So the water lily's leaves have a waxy surface, and that actually means that the water doesn't settle on top of the leaf. The water is kind of um, dispelled or pushed off the leaf surface. And that means that as much sunlight as possible can hit the water lily leaf and they can photosynthesize really well. Then probably one of the more 
uh, interesting adaptations is um, that some plants living in wetlands are carnivorous. So to cope with low levels of nutrients, they've actually adapted to be able to consume insects. So this plant over here on the right is a sundew, and you can see it's got these red sort of like spikes or tentacles sticking out. And at the end of those spikes, there are these little um, glistening sort of like dew drops, and they look kind of like nectar. So the poor insect thinks it's coming towards some lovely nectar, and then all of a sudden, as soon as it touches the plant, it gets trapped. And then the, the plant releases these digestive enzymes and breaks it down and eats it. So, just a couple of examples of ways that plants have um, adapted to live in their wetland environments. And as you can probably see as well, a lot of these plants are uniquely adapted to cope with wetland situations and you don't find them in other habitats like they're unique to wetlands. So wetlands have a unique set of plants and animals that live in them and they also are very productive places and they host a lot of biodiversity. So there's actually a lot of um, primary production and photosynthesis and things like that that happens in wetlands and they've been called biological super systems. And you get uh, species that live in wetlands for their whole lives, but you also get some species that maybe just interact with wetlands every now and again. So they're also relying on wetlands, but they don't spend their whole lives there. Um, an example, maybe in a specific Irish context, would be um, the wintering birds that spend um, the winter months here in Ireland. So if you think of the migratory uh, geese and swans that come here in the winter, they feed on wetlands. And even though they're not living in our Irish wetlands the whole year round, they are relying on them for a, an important part of their life. So there's a whole wide range, a wide web of species that are dependent on and relying on wetland habitats. As well as all of this amazing biodiversity that wetlands host, they also provide us with numerous ecosystem services. So ecosystem services are things that are provided by ecosystems that are of benefit to us as humans. Some of the examples of ecosystem services provided by wetlands are things like food, clean water, fuel, building materials, providing habitat for pollinators, storing carbon to help with climate regulation, flood regulation, and things that you might not um, necessarily associate um, with ecosystems and ecosystem services, but the recreation and amenity value of wetlands and the benefits to our physical and mental health that we obtain from spending time outdoors and in nature, the cultural heritage. So if you think about the archaeology, the culture, the myths and folklore that go along with wetlands and the inspirational value that we take from these habitats as well. So as you can see, um, wetlands provide us with a whole range of things and these are often things that we take for granted you know we we um, make use of these things in our daily lives but we don't often think where they come from or how they're provided to us and a lot of work has been done over the past sort of couple of decades I guess in trying to evaluate or put a, a money value on these ecosystem services and what all of this work has basically come to tell us is that ecosystem services are really valuable in terms of money. They're estimated to be worth trillions of dollars every year, which is more, it's twice than our global gross domestic product. But unfortunately, oh, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> There's also been work done in, um, in Monaghan to look at the economic value of wetland sites in your county. So back in 2008, a study was done and it looked at six different wetland sites in Monaghan. So they ranged from um, quite a small lake all the way up to a really, really large site with a um, uh, large peatland site. And it was estimated that over 50 years, the value of these wetlands range, would range from 10,000 euros for the small site to up to nearly 3 million for the large site. And that would actually be an underestimate as well, because that particular did study didn't include the cost associated with carbon and carbon storage. Um, and some more work that's been done on, on trying to understand the economic value of wetlands in Monaghan is uh, looking at um, visitor numbers. So in 2015, there was 65,000 overseas visitors in County Monaghan, and that generated 25 million euro in revenue. Now, like some of these visitors probably would have come to Monaghan specifically to, to visit wetland sites, like maybe they came to 
come on a fishing holiday, uh, a walking trip uh, to do water sports. And some of them may have just taken part in activities in or around wetlands during their visit. Um, so you can see that the presence of wetlands is a really important part in the economy of County Monaghan as well. Um, so even though we've done a lot, you know, a lot of work has been done in general just on putting a monetary value on ecosystem services, this isn't really often actually fully appreciated until we get to a time and a place when ecosystems have been damaged and degraded so much that they can't produce these ecosystem services to us anymore. And it's only when we need to replace the ecosystem service with an artificial alternative that we really realize how important these things were. This is a big problem for wetlands. As Shirley touched on already, they've traditionally been viewed as very sort of unproductive areas, as wastelands, places where you can just dump your rubbish, places that should be changed into what might be viewed as more productive, in inverted commas, land. <coughs> Excuse me. So this isn't just a trend in County Monaghan. It's not just a trend in Ireland, it's a global trend. So um, globally, 35% of wetlands have been lost. <coughs> Excuse me. Have been lost between 1970 and 2015. Wetlands are thought to be disappearing three times as fast as forests. And 25% of wetland plants and animals are currently at risk of extinction. And as we already saw, a lot of those plants and animals are uniquely adapted to living in wetlands. So when their habitat is gone, it's not like they can just move into, say, a woodland and survive. They're uniquely adapted to those wetlands. This is an issue not just because of the loss of biodiversity and the loss of ecosystem services, but also um, specifically it's an issue when we think about carbon. So this is like, you know, really big in the media at the moment. It's on everyone's mind, everyone's agenda the climate change issue and our carbon targets. And if you take peatlands, which are just one type of wetland, they cover just 3% of the Earth's surface. Yet, they're the largest terrestrial carbon store that we have. They store nearly 30% of our soil carbon, but that's only if they're in an undamaged state, if they're pristine. A damaged peatland actually becomes a source of carbon. It's contributing to our problems. And as well as that, it can't carry out the other ecosystem services as well as it used to be able to before either. So a good example of that when you look at peatlands is the flood regulation ecosystem service. So if you think of a peatland like a sponge, when there's an awful lot of rainfall or when there's really high levels of flood, the peatland can actually absorb the extra water and hold it. And then when conditions are drier or even when there's a drought, the the peatland can slowly release water back out. So it's acting like a sponge holding and slowly releasing water. But if you cut the sponge, so if you come along and drain your peatland, it can no longer hold water like that anymore. And that ecosystem service isn't being provided like it used to be. Um, and so as, as, as Shirley mentioned, you know, a lot of restoration work is, um, is being looked at and it's being carried out, but depending on how much damage has been done, it can often be quite difficult and expensive to restore these habitats. And really what would have made more sense from the start is to conserve what we had. So the main pressures and threats that are facing wetlands, the reason why our ecosystem services are potentially under pressure are things like drainage, changes in land use, these two often go hand in hand. So often to have a change in wetland land use, you need to drain it to dry it out. Pollution, dumping of rubbish, infilling, um, high levels of nutrient runoff causing eutrophication and sort of like algal blooms in wetland systems. Like all habitats and all ecosystems, wetlands are under threat from climate change. And the um, introduction and spread of invasive species is also a problem in wetlands. So um, these invasive species potentially outcompeting our native wetland biodiversity. So thankfully, over the last couple of decades, I suppose, there's been a growing awareness of the importance of wetlands um, in Ireland and globally. So wetlands are protected under national and international law 
there is the Ramsar Convention um, on Wetlands, which was started in the 1970s, which is an agreement between lots of different countries to protect their wetlands. And in Ireland, we've had a Rem Ramsar Wetland Group in operation since 2010. And so going forward, it's really important that any of our wetland sites that are still in really good condition are protected and that we then identify those sites where restoration is possible and that we do restore them back so that they're able to um, provide us with the ecosystem services that we, um, we used to get from these places. And hopefully from this uh, brief talk, um, you will see that there's a value to this conservation and restoration work um, from lots of different aspects, including the economic um, perspective, climate, health and well-being and culture and heritage. So to finish, I'm just going to leave you with this quote um, from David Attenborough. He says, no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they have never experienced. And I think that's a really good one. So I think without having experienced or understanding, for example, a wetland, you're not really going to care about it. You're not going to think it's worth protecting. And that's also a really good reason why it's so important that our wetlands are conserved and restored so that future generations have a chance to experience them, understand their importance and continue to protect them. So thank you so much for listening. And um, yeah, we'll take questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks very much, Catherine, that's brilliant. Um, great talk. Uh, Peter, uh, so next up is Peter Foss. Uh, Peter is very, very familiar with the wetlands of Monaghan, having done a lot of survey work there since I suppose last 15 or 20 years nearly now. Um, but uh, so Peter's done an awful lot of work on that and also per wetland awareness and everything else. And that was after he spent many years at Irish Peatland Conservation Council also promoting the wise use of peatlands. Um, so Peter, I'll um, hand over to you if you want to right. share the screen there. Peter's going to tell us all about the, I suppose, the, what the work that's going on at the moment, which is developing the wetland, uh, the Monaghan Wetland Action Plan. So Are we all on screen there, everybody? Yes, great. Okay, good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for the introduction, Paddy. Yeah, uh, God, when I don't want to think back how many years it has been since I've been trying to do all this. But anyway, we leave that aside, you know, you can see the grey. Um, my um, unenviable task this evening is to try and tell you everything that we've done since the start of the project, let you know kind of uh, where we're planning on going and then hopefully giving you some and uh, getting feedback from yourselves and all the people that have uh, given up their valuable time this evening to join us to hear more about restoring wetlands in Monaghan and the development of this Monaghan Wetland Action Plan. So um, basically uh, we started work on the plan during 2020 um, and uh, um, uh, how do I move this thing forward? Oh, sorry. Excuse me. I have to get my buttons sorted out here. Um, uh, we started in uh, 2020 on the project um, and the mission of the project, um, slightly plagiarized probably from the um, new heritage plan that Shirley has prepared, was to develop an action plan which sets a way forward to resource, protect and enhance, conserve and advocate for County Monaghan's wetland biodiversity and heritage. Um, so to actually kind of try and put in place a plan, uh, a bit like what Shirley was referring to earlier on, not just recording where wetlands are, doing inventories of them, but actually doing something to try and get their protection pushed forward at a county level and not be waiting for national legislation or whatever, maybe just to take um, the lead on all of that. And um, in the development of the project, there were a few key elements that we kind of focused in on. Um, which I'm going to go over in the talk that I'm presenting to you now the, today. Oh, goodness, excuse me, we don't touch that mouse. Um, uh, basically, we pulled together during last year, it was published in November, a, a methodology report which outlines the kind of the scope for this particular project. We also uh, decided and undertook an ecosystem service analysis um, on the project, which I'll give you more information about. We've uh, 
looked at restoration and enhancement potential measures that could be undertaken at some of these sites. This is um, uh, probably the part of the project that's most in its infancy, and it will be developed further during the rest of this year when we take on um, some um, test wetlands and go out there and work out what needs to be done and how much all of this is going to cost us. And we've uh, initiated the whole idea of trying to engage the community because my personal feeling is that without community engagement, all these plans are lovely. We have biodiversity plans at a national level, yet our biodiversity is still going down year after year. We have um, EU Habitats Direct, which are supposed to protect habitats, yet in every second habitat in the country is in a poor state of um, protection. And from my time at the IPCC and all the other work that I've done since then on wetlands, I've found that basically it's community support for conserving a wetland is what actually gets it protected. Take in case, for example, a, a project that I was involved in with the IPCC, which was Fenerbog down in Waterford, which was going to be turned into a landfill site. And yet it's the most fabulous transition mire in the county. Uh, we have something, we have another project like the Abbey Leaks Bog, which IPCC at the time were involved in the early stages of getting that actually conserved. I remember sitting in boardrooms with Board Mona when they laughed at us when we said we would get Abbey Leaks protected, um, when, whereas their intention was to actually mine it. So community engagement and capacity building and getting local people and local communities or local landowners, whatever, involved in protecting these habitats is crucial. All right. So to the methodology report, and I have a lot to cover. I was given the kind of the hard part to do here, but um, so I'll go, I will go at a reasonable speed, but I know I won't be able to get everything covered. So, but I'm very happy at the end for any of you that have questions and we, I'll fill it in there. So basically what we did is we produced a methodology report, which was to look at the whole idea of how would you go about protecting the resource in County Monaghan. Um, Along with the report and the actual, the, uh, the sort of the written side, we also developed, and Patrick was heavily involved in this, uh, developing a GIS system, a geographic information system, where all of these wetlands could be stored, the boundaries of them, and we could use a whole range of other data sets that are out there produced by the EPA and whatever else to assess, you know, how important these wetlands are. And we produced a, a, a number of databases that would hold all of the information on these wetlands. You'll get some numbers from me now shortly, um, and you'll see that without this kind of system, you wouldn't be able to cope with doing an assessment of 200 sites or whatever. So in terms of the database, we use the Monaghan wetland map that Shirley has already uh, referred to earlier. Um, it got a bit of a revision. It was given a tidy up and a bit of a makeover. Uh, we also added an ecosystem services assessment section to this database where we could look at the actual ecosystem service values of all of these wetlands. Um, and then we've also we're maintaining a community project contact register where all of the people that are getting in touch with us and asking questions and asking about a particular site or whatever we record that information so that when we are no longer involved in the project we can hand all of this information over to whoever comes after us um, and the key actions that were identified in the report anyway that uh, we felt were very important was to review the various factors and pressures affecting wetlands in County Monaghan, these threats that Mary Catherine was talking about just a moment ago in her um, uh, presentation. Uh, we also wanted to classify the wetlands in a broader sense. I mean, we have wetland surveys that have been done on the county and they're great. They say, oh yes, this site is nationally important because it has a sexy bit of fan on it or a wonderful piece of bog or whatever it is. But when it comes to this kind of, you know, protection of wetlands on, at a county level, we felt that we couldn't just look at the narrow biodiversity value. We wanted to look at a broader uh, spectrum of um, values that wetlands have. And this is why this ecosystem services um, analysis was uh, kind of earmarked as being fundamentally important. We also um, wanted to identify the key enhancement measures that could be undertaken at sites. And one of the, the things uh, that we decided to do was in relation to the restoration potential and action measures specific to a particular site, we'd look at a number of key wetland sites 
in Mayo during this year and try and draw up, if you like, a, a kind of a, um, a recipe list of what could be done on these wetlands, um, what this will cost, and who we could partner with or who the County Council and the Heritage Office in Monaghan could partner with to actually undertake these measures. Uh, again, the key thing is we can't go and protect all of the wetlands that are out there in Monaghan. We can only really do it when we have the support of either landowners or um, a particular farmer who might own an area. So that's why in the first round of um, sort of restoration uh, projects that we were going to work on, we really wanted to kind of work with given partners. So we're hoping that out of this presentation, maybe this evening, a few of you will come forward and say, oh yes, we'd like to protect the little lake down the end of the lane in our particular village or in our particular area or whatever. Um, the other thing as well, in, in terms of the methodology report, we identify that uh, cooperation at this level, as I mentioned earlier, with community partners is really crucial. Um, and one of the other things we want to do through all of the resources that we're making available, like the report, like the map, some of them, I'll give you a list at the end and you'll see a variety of things where you can go and learn more about wetlands, go out and experience some of Monaghan's wetlands and get in tune with David Attenborough and his comment that Mary Catherine shared and actually go and see some of these areas. So this is the only slide of this type I promise to show you all evening, but it's just to give you an idea of the, the scale of the project, all right? So the first one of the first things we did during last year, and it's included in the methodology report, was actually to undertake an assessment of all the factors affecting wetlands in, in Monaghan. So in other words, threats and impacts. And I've just circled um, sort of four particular areas here that that, that would be of interest. The, excuse me, I have to be careful. This mouse is very hiccupy tonight. Um, we've got 636 sites registered in the Monaghan Wetland Map Project. And out of these 202, this is a number I'll refer to later on, um, have had detailed wetland surveys undertaken. Um, and so we have habitat information, impacts that occurred on the sites or whatever. So they doubt they're there, if you like, the basis for the following um, assessment um, part of the project that I'll be outlining to you. And in terms of the sites in Monaghan, the two key um, things that came out of the, the analysis of impacts and threats was undertaken on all of the wetlands, because although we haven't actually physically visited some of them, other groups have, or they're listed as natural heritage areas, and they record impacts and threats as well. And you can see that the two key impacts that are affecting uh, wetlands in the county are pollution. And this is the, the top category. These and underneath it, you'll see more detailed information as to what we mean by pollution. Um, everything from surface runoff, farming inputs, uh, atmospheric inputs from you know, nitrogen and things like this, ammonia. And the other key factor that is affecting wetlands is the natural system modification, which is a kind of a broad term to cover air, all the different drainage, infill, landfill, reclamation, um, um, projects that various people have undertaken to either drain, rehabilitize, or turn something into farmland. And they're the two largest threats to uh, wetlands that we noted in Monaghan, and they've also been um, the, the activities that have most influenced the wetlands in Monaghan. Uh, the, the first number is, you know, what's actually affected the site. The second one is how many of the sites that of the 636 are threatened with that impact. So the situation is kind of fairly dire and it would explain why we're suffering from biodiversity loss and habitat loss and habitat degradation when you look at those figures. Okay, the second major part of the project um, um, was to undertake this ecosystem service analysis. And we used the RAWS ecosystem service analysis, which is uh, uh, um, an analysis uh, brought forward and created and promulgated by Ramsar, the International Convention on Wetlands. And as I was explaining earlier on, the, the ecosystem service analysis looks at all of the benefits that we can get from a wetland and they're grouped into four main themes the provisioning services 
which are basically um, the kind of materials that we can take from a wetland. We've got the regulatory services, which are um, uh, the kind of the, 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 the services that the wetland provides that allows us to um, and enjoy being alive on the planet. So things like air quality, flood control, storm um, um, protection, all sorts, all of these things that are listed there on the side. We've also got the cultural services. Um, which uh, Mary Catherine referred to, that that's the recreation value of wetlands. Are they important for tourism? Do they have an aesthetic value or religious value or um, an educational value? And then the final thing uh, or the final theme under the, the Ramsar ecosystem service analysis was the supporting service analysis, which is basically, you know, um, in relation to, for example, carbon sequestration, is it forming soils, is peat being deposited? Um, uh, is the wetland providing a nutrient cycling service, a water recycling service, and of course from a biodiversity, because where do birds and bees and bugs fit into all of this, the provision of habitats and all the rest is where basically the biodiversity aspect is taken care of. So there are 32 uh, services listed there and every one of the wetlands um, that we brought forward for assessment were assessed against these 32 criteria. And basically the, the criteria therefore gives us a much broader impression and a way to rank the sites in the county, not just are they important because it's a turlock or is it because they're important because it's a raised bog, but all of the services that they provide. The other thing I should say is that interesting enough, of course, although um, under provisioning services, you might take fuel from a bog. Each of these services is analyzed, if you like, independently of every other one. So a site can be providing turf and fuel for, the, for somebody, and that's a positive benefit. It takes a moment to get your head around. But of course, if you're taking peat out on the one hand and it's positive, you can assume that, as Mary Catherine said, that's causing a drainage impact somewhere else. It's having a negative effect on carbon storage. So although it gets a positive for removal of our provision of one half of, uh, service, that may have a counter effect somewhere else. So um, it's just a, a thing in case you're wondering why some of them sites come out of the levels that we, we found. So. Um, Basically, what we did was we took those 202 sites plus another seven, which are very important from an amenity point of view in Monaghan, and we decided we would undertake on those and the full ecosystem service analysis. So the 36 ecosystem services were examined on each site, and they were ranked on a five point scale being very positive, which is kind of like uh, down to uh, a extremely negative uh, uh, impact or whatever or uh, scale. Um, we then out of those 209 sites, 177 were actually found to contain significant area wetlands. Uh, the other 30 odd sites are things like holy wells and springs that mm, in many cases have been capped. And although they were assessed initially or in, uh, surveyed as part of the wetland survey, they don't really contain a wetland. So there wasn't any point in actually carrying out the full RAWS assessment on those sites. And the end effect was that as we got a range of scores for the sites in Monaghan going from everything from minus nine to 25.5. Um, in theory, the maximum score any site in the county could score would be 31. Um, so, uh, and we had within the 177 sites, we have 13 sites that had an extremely high um, ecosystem service value. We've about 130 that fell between the 10 and 20 uh, range, and we have 33 sites that came in below an ecosystem service value of 10. Um, they're definitely all in trouble, those kind of sites. Um, and then after the ecosystem service analysis, we did two further um, assessments of the wetland. And one was to see in terms of these regulatory and supporting services, which is things like you know, air quality, um, storm regulation, flood control, could restoration on the wetland actually help um, increase the ecosystem score in those two areas? 
That was one analysis we did. And the second one we, we undertook was based on the survey information that we have from every site. What is the list of potential restoration measures that could be proposed for the site? So um, this was to try and rank all of the sites in Monaghan from, you know, the, the most likely to be improved by restoration work to the one that is least likely to be uh, improved. And just to give you an example of three particular sites here, I've just picked out uh, three of the, the wetlands in question. We've got Glasslock Lake, which is a PNHA, a natural heritage area. Um, and it was one of the highest scoring sites that we had in the county. Um, you can see the provisioning regulatory cultural and supporting services there and the values for each. The middle site is Morgan's Lock. It's near the Kaluski Lock Cluster uh, over in the west of the county, um, which is a, sort of a middle of the road site. It's scoring a 13. It's been affected by drainage um, and um, nutrient input. Uh, from surrounding farmland. So uh, some of the regulatory and supporting services or particularly the regulatory services aren't where we'd like them to be. And then the final one is another site over in the west of the county, Derry Beg Bog, which is, or at the time it was surveyed, I think in 2010 or 2011, um, was being used to actively harvest peat. And of course, because this site effectively no longer has ecosystem services it came down it came out with a very bad score and you can see at the bottom in the bottom row uh, the text rows we've indicated whether the regulatory or supporting services could be improved um, um, uh, with cooperation uh, from owners and all that kind of carry on and also what could be done at um, um, a practical level to actually improve those services. The last one, the difficulty is it runs into Northern Ireland. That's one of the issues that was uh, highlighted in the methodology report that we have a number of sites that cross the border, which is a difficulty. Um, but the other thing as well is until peat extraction at a site like that stops or is driven out of business by carbon tax and all the other climate um, changes that are being proposed at the moment, it's very likely that nothing very much can be done there perhaps when peat extraction ceases, it might be possible to actually do some habitat and uh, restoration at that particular site. So that's just to give you a kind of a flavor of how the, um, the ranking was done. Well, on the community engagement, which is another part of the project, I have to be careful of my time here, we, um, and the capacity building, we've done a number of different projects. The first one is we have uh, developed an online map which is publicly available, anyone can consult it, and you can see the sites that are being assessed as part of this project this year, these 202 sites. It also shows all the other wetlands in Monaghan. If you turn on that particular layer, you can look at the sites in relation to wetland, um, sorry, wetland indicating subsoils. You can have layers for the NHAs, SACs, all that kind of thing in the county. So this is a resource, either my last slide will have the addresses for all of these, uh, these uh, um, online applications available. We've also publicized the development of the plan on social media, on the Monaghan Heritage website, on the Wetland Surveys Ireland website, and Facebook and Twitter pages and all that kind of carry on. We've carried out a public survey, which I think all of you are asked to do this evening um, before attending this webinar, where we kind of asked people to give us um, their idea or their feedback on what they think about wetlands in Monaghan under a range of questions. Uh, it wasn't only the, the, the public survey had a number of different aspects to it. One was we were trying to actually give a little bit of a, a thought, uh, um, a bit of educational um, to the whole process of wetlands and make people aware of some of the values that they have. But the, we also included quite specific questions under particular the cultural service aspect of wetlands where maybe uh, us as scientists are a little bit weaker um, than we would like to be in the database was perhaps not providing all the information we could get from it and it was quite interesting we've got quite a lot of folklore stories and the importance of sites for archaeology and everything coming out of the survey and that information is kind of gone and fed back into the ecosystem service assessment that we did we've also worked with a range of local groups and we're maintaining a register. So we've been in touch with Law Pro and uh, the Monaghan Tidy Towns group and all these kind of thing. 
And just from the public survey, I just thought I'd put up one slide that was a bit colorful. Um, and this is the a word cloud generated from the hundred and I think about a, the first 120 responses into the survey. Um, and you can see uh, a range of uh, um, words coming up, a lot that we would expect to see, wildlife, bogs, water, biodiversity, nature, all that kind of thing. But you can also see that a number of these, the words that are coming up are related to, for example, these cultural services. So for example, something is beautiful. Um, Archaeology has come up, it's important. Um, and we've even had some sites um, come up high on the list um, in, during the word cloud, which is things like the Bally Bay Wetland Centre, for example, or Bragan Mountain Schlieve Bay, which uh, Rory is going to talk about shortly. So it, uh, the, the, the survey had multiple function or multiple reasons for being undertaken. And I think the response that we received to date is fantastic. It's one of the things that we're going to be assessing and looking at and um, analyzing over the next uh, few weeks. We decided we would let it run until the end of this webinar today. So if any of your friends haven't yet filled in the Monaghan Wetland, uh, survey opinion poll, please get them to do so as soon as possible. And we'll uh, eventually publish the results of that particular survey and let you see what people think about wetlands in the county. And the next steps, I'll keep this very short because I think I'm probably coming up to my time or maybe I've gone over. Um, we are the, the, the next step for this project now will be to identify some sites in the county where maybe we can partner with local group or stakeholders to actually do the this pilot um, study of restoration measures that are required for an area and go about, you know, costing these and hopefully putting some of the local groups in touch with funders or whatever that will be able to help out in this regard and actually undertake some restoration work. Um, we're going to be obviously costing um, these measures, it'll be part of, sorry, excuse me, it'll be part of the uh, um, the methodology report, there'll be a, a table and it shows you how much it will cost to block a drain, to put in a leaky dam, to put a bund on a thing, to fence off an area at the edge of a lake, whatever it is. So the, the cost, all of these different measures will be costed. We're going to be researching as well um, funding sources to help undertake all of this work. We're going to continue with the public engagement engagement uh, as much as we can and this is probably uh, an aspect of the work that's going to increase over the the summer months while we get out there and meet some of these um, project partners that we hope are out there in the county only itching to come forward and wave at us and uh, the final thing of course will be produce the county monaghan Witton action plan report for the autumn of this year and those, by the way, are some of those resources that I was telling you about, links to those. So the project map, they're all bitly links, so as to make it nice and easy. So that's the Monaghan map, if you want to go and see which sites are being looked at and all the rest at the moment. We're just differentiated between the sites that are being looked at in the project and all the other wetland sites we have in Monaghan. But as we go forward, we will the map will be adjusted and we'll hopefully bring in some of the information that we've gained from the ecosystem service assessment and also show at the end of the day which sites we've um, picked as our pilot sites or our key restoration sites in the county. There's also um, the survey, this public survey I was telling about, the link to that. We've got a, a story map on metlands in County Monaghan for anyone who would like it out there and actually visit a site in the county. I think there's 12 or 13 sites that are open to the public. So again, get out there and actually experience a wetland and have a look around and see would you like to be involved in something like that. There's a range of publications. Of course, the most important one is Shirley's um, uh, book on Monaghan wetlands produced uh, two years ago, which is available from the Heritage Office. And then we've got on both the Wetland Surveys Ireland website under the news and media section and on the Monaghan County Council website under their heritage section, information on this project as it's been going on and things like the results of the survey and that kind of thing will all be up there at the end of the day and possibly even something on this presentation this evening, I'm not sure. So thank you very much for your time. That's me finished. Very good, Peter. Excellent. Um, not too bad. About three minutes over. We'll That's okay. With that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very good. Uh, you had a lot to you had a lot to go through. Serious amount of work involved the last couple of months. Um, 
Uh, Rory, we're going to introduce um, Rory now this evening. He's an ecologist working on the CAN project. He has worked across uh, marine freshwater and upland ecosystems. And uh, Rory's going to explain all about the um, work he's been doing up in Schlieve Bay uh, as part of the CAN project. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. One second. Uh, what has me being share screen? Share. Uh, can everyone see my slideshow then, all right? Yeah, you're there. Slideshow from beginning. So thanks, Peter, and um, coming straight after you. I'm very excited about this uh, Ross uh, method that you guys are using to, you know, to quantify the, the ecosystem services because it's, you know, it's going to tell us in kind of uh, people can look at a wetland and go, that's a good wetland, you know, it's, it's good or it's, it's not good. And that can be subjective. And, you know, that method, it takes the, the subjectiveness out of it and that's very useful when you're you're going to funding agencies and you want to say look we, we want that money and it's it's fantastic to see it being used it's great to see it being trialed um being trialed here you know or not trialed but actually rolled out here in county monaghan like. so uh my name is rory sheehan i uh work on a project called the can project and it is the collaborative action for the nature network project and it is funded by the european union through the interreg funding and that funding is administered by the Special European Programs Body. Once I got my funders address out of the way, then I can move on a, a little bit. So the CAM project, what is it? Well, it is a European funded project and it's a group of 12, 12 different agencies that are brought together to do conservation work in the border area between Scotland, the Republic of Ireland and the North of Ireland. So we've got local government in uh, the North and the Republic, such as Amra, Bambridge, Craig Avonborough Council, Monaghan County Council. Uh, we have environmental NGOs like the Golden Eagle Trust and Ulster Wildlife. Uh, we have educational institutes like IT Sligo and the University of Ulster. And we're all coming together to deliver different conservation actions. And the CAN project uh, in Monaghan is working on the Sleeve Bay site in County Monaghan. And it's run through the Heritage Office in Monaghan County Council. So where is uh, Sleeve Bay? So the Sleeve Bay site is here. So this picture that we're looking at is a big yellow area and a big sort of uh, lilac -y colored area and a big yellow area is the special protected area in Northern Ireland and the lilac -y area is the special protected area in the Republic of Ireland and kind of to the top of the picture there up at the very top you'd have Clogher and then sort of down to the bottom right of the picture there you'd have Monaghan Town and then over to the say the bottom left of the picture you'd be close to Listen to Ski just to give you a bit of idea so within that big area there the CAM project is working doing a range of different things for two different things, for species and for habitats. And then we kind of come in and we look at a smaller area here then. So this is like a small chunk and this is what people would know as Braggan or Sleeve Bay. And this is the, the higher hill part of that. And then we've kind of got a green outlined area there and that's our Ramsar site or, and it's also a special area of conservation and an area of special scientific interest in the North of Ireland. And then we have the red, area there and that's our national uh, heritage area in the Republic of Ireland and those are inside those other areas that I showed you earlier and they're kind of what we would know as Sleeve Bay and what people would think of as Sleeve Bay and that's the big upland area that's there. Now it's a fantastic upland it's a big stretch of blanket bog and that's that bog you get on the hills and it's maybe a little bit of an unusual bog because it's quite far east in Ireland and it's normally that type of bog we would have would be more closer to the Atlantic but this one is a little bit further east, so it's a very important bog area. So what's the CAN project doing? Well, there's a number of different things, and this is just a, most of my, this is the only slide I think that has text really out after this and the rest of the slides are just pictures, but we're doing two different things. So it's down to habitat actions. So we're doing things that directly affect the bog, and then we're doing species actions. So we have two different roles. We have the species that are protected under that European legislation that, Peter was mentioning is uh, maybe not uh, functioning as well as it would have been envisaged at the time that it was brought in. So such as the birds, the EU birds protective, birds directive, or the habitats directive. So we're doing things like cutting down invasive conifer trees. So where you've got a bog area and you have conifer trees, pine trees planted around the edge of that area in dense forestry plantation, those seeds get blown out into the bog. And when those seeds grow on the bog, they start to dry out the peat and they take they stop the bog from functioning functioning properly not only do they damage the bog itself but if you have imagine a little wading bird and it wants to nest out on the open bog and it sees a tree quite close to it and it's used to nesting on open bog with no trees near it 
if it sees a tree closer and it's afraid that there might be a crow up in that tree or some other predator that's going to eat it or its eggs so it won't use that area of bog and in quite a large circle around the base of that tree so so those trees are affecting the species as well as the habitat we're putting together a wildfire uh, management plan for the site which is very topical i think at the minute we've seen the fires we had in ireland and um, thankfully we actually have a little bit of rain just looking out my window there we've a small bit of rain at the minute but so the wildfire management plan has been run and um, i'll talk maybe a bit about that and some fires a little bit later on and uh, then we're looking to do some community stuff with some volunteer tree removal tying that in with some training courses that one of our partners is running Armagh Bambridge Craig Avonborough Council are running a training course uh, where people get to uh, get chainsaw qualification and pesticide application qualification then we're also doing some grazing stuff up there on the land on Sleeve Bay um, a big section of the land was transferred this time last year from ownership by uh, Lord Rossmore into Antashka's ownership so Antashka are now the ownership and they're uh, trialing upland grazing of cattle up there and I'll talk maybe a small bit about that at the end. Then some of the species stuff we're doing then will be nest protection activities for some of these very rare birds like the hen harrier or the red grouse and that particularly the curlew as well and then also we're putting up there um, say grit for grouse to they need that grouse to utilize the header fully. So I'm going to talk a little bit first about drain blocking. I didn't really have that on my list, but one of the things that uh, Mary Catherine went through in her talk is how uh, when wetlands dry out and, and it's the damage that is caused when you have a wetland that dries out. So I'm not really going to go into that. I'm going to try and play a little picture here. So this is the Sleeve Bay uplands. This is not in County Monaghan, but it's right up against the border here between Monaghan and Northern Ireland. I think it's very important to look at this upland site. It's it, And Peter mentioned it in his uh, one of his sites as well uh, about the turf extraction right on the border and we have that transboundary issue where you have the border the site is just a big upland area and there happens to be a geographical boundary through the middle of it and that doesn't that boundary is doesn't uh, the the peat and the plants and the birds and the animals there don't care about that international boundary so they all inhabit that upland area equally so i'm going to show a little bit of video just of what happens when you drain a bog and you see a bog surface like that and you don't see much water moving but Hopefully this works. No, if it doesn't work, someone shout at me. So just a short little snippet. When you have a bog, um, that digger in the background of that picture there, of that video there, is part of the project. So a healthy bog shouldn't have drains like that moving through it and those drains at that site were installed by the forestry service up in the north of ireland close to 50 years ago with the intention of planting that area uh, planting an area of deep peat up on the bog luckily enough the seedlings never made it into the bog but we're left behind with a big section of dry peat that has all the problems that mary catherine talked about so what do we do to that well a big project like the Cairn project, we have um, the ability to bring in a lot of resources and a lot of mapping. And I think one of the things here tonight is that uh, Peter had mentioned, you know, community groups. Everybody here present at this talk tonight has the ability to reach out to Peter and to Mary Catherine and to Patrick and to tap into their knowledge when it comes to rehabilitating wetlands. And they have an excellent understanding and they'll be able to share that information with you and hopefully we can get some community groups come forward to look at pilot projects and pilot sites within the county. Now. And I'll just show you, this is the complicated part of how you see where the drains are and how they need to be fixed. And then I'll show you the simple part after that. So this is, uh, we would have commissioned aerial uh, LIDAR imagery. That's where a plane flies over and it shines a laser, a light ranging laser over the bog. And it can detect all the tiny little holes, tiny little undulations in the surface of the land. And from that then consultants uh, can map out all the drains and you can see on my screen here we've got yellow and green lines we've got yellow and green dots and each one of those green dots is a peat dam that the con that our consultants told us we need we should install into the bog and that slows down the water and stops the water from moving out of the bog yeah. now the very simple method when it comes to seeing does a does a bog need to be rehabilitated is just to stand and look in and if you can see a drain with water moving through it on peat soil well, then ideally that should be blocked up or that in best practice that could be blocked up so it doesn't have to be a very complicated process just to see a very quick visual inspection there you can see where we've got a drain it may be full of moss but at the same time that the water is moving very quickly also then on the right 
um, as well. It's not just the drains. You have these things called hags too that can develop, and that's where you have these big mounds of bare peat, and the sides on those uh, mounds can mean that the peat dries out, and there's another tool you can use to rehabilitate those. So conservation and ecology can be kind of uh, not very subtle sometimes. Um, we got contractors to install peat dams into the bog, and I'll talk about how their peat dams are, are put in, but this is actually one of the diggers from the contractors, and they are that's sitting on top of a dam, and you can see the water is right up to the level. You can't really see the dam they've installed because of the method they use when they're placing these dams into the bogs. So this picture here, the picture on the left, we're looking up and down a drain, and you can see freshly disturbed peat up near the top of that picture. And the, the driver has come along and he's done a thing called a key. So he's dug out peat either side of the drain and he has put that peat back in to form a key so that the water won't erode through the dam. It'll have to move around the sides of the dam. And it's called a keyed dam made out of peat that we put into these bogs. And there is National Parks and Wildlife have a very good manual on how to do this sort of work. So it's very easy to train up a, a digger driver to put in a dam like this. And it's relatively straightforward operation and we have that skill set to, to show people how that can be done. Like. This is just to give you a little quick idea of a time lapse of a machine working um, up there on Sleeve Bay. This is one of the first days they're up there. The weather can be pretty bad. We haven't seen uh, misty weather like this for a while, kind of nostalgic for it. I was just sitting down having a cup of coffee on my, on my break and I just took a quick picture. But you can see the machine working away here in the bog and it's taking peat from beside the, the drain from what we call a barrel pit and placing that peat into the into the drain itself and then packing it down. And it's a very, it's a job that a good contractor can work through quite quickly, but it does take a little bit of skill for a digger driver to do a large area like this um, to be able to successfully do that. Like, So this is a before and after picture. On the left, we have a drain that hadn't, just doesn't have dams installed into it. And you can see that the water level in that drain is, is down, well down. If you were to stand, if I was to stand in that drain on the left, with my wellies on, I the height of the edge of the drain would be up to about my hip height, and I'd be about just under the, the six foot. Like, and then you can see on the right that the water level is right up to the edge of that drain after we place those peat dams in there. So that's bringing that water level right up. Literally within hours of installing a peat dam, the water level comes back up. And putting those peat dams into the bog is like when a you have a cut on your arm and a, a surgeon comes along and stitches it up. It's 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 healing that wound on the bog. Like, right. Moving a little bit slowly through my presentation, so I'll, I'll clip along a bit quicker. This is some pictures of some more peat dams we put in there. Again, you can see that the water level is brought right up to the surface of the bog there. And that's what's bringing that bog back into, into healthy condition. This is just a picture looking out uh, with some of our pine forestry looking out in a, uh, down towards this Niski area of Sleeve Bay. And then this is in County Monaghan looking down towards Nakatalan town direction. Nice sunny weather up there in Sea Bay. You can have all weathers up there. Like. Another thing that we're doing is conifer removal. And you can see here is a large tree that we would have taken out. So we've got contractors in to remove some of the conifer trees that are there. And this has a couple of benefits. Um, taking this conifer tree out helps to reduce the amount of seeds being blown out into the bog. And that's an ecological term called propagule pressure. And it also helps to, in this case, those trees were kind of just out on their own and they were in between two big areas of bog that hen harriers would have moved back and forth between. And so this brings that flight path back into use or it makes it more available for the hen harriers to fly through. They don't have to fly around the trees, they can just fly up and down. And then again, we have a before and after picture. So on the left is the before and on the after is the right. And we're looking the same direction there. And you can see all those small little trees, self-seeding conifers that would have been blown out onto the bog. And those trees were all cleared, removed and taken off the bog by uh, contractors and uh, that's helping that bog come back into into good condition stopping it from from drying out but we can see some of that header there on the bog that's very important so that header is is really important as long header is very important for hen harriers to nest in and young regeneration header is very important food source for the great grouse so fires we've had some fires recently up on sleeve bay particularly in the northern part so this is one from not last week the week before last uh, luckily, we were able to get the uh, fire and rescue service out. Uh, they were able to put that out. Uh, the fire would have started around half five and it was out by eight o'clock or so. So it was one of these fires. And that's the thing is these uncontrolled fires up on that peatland are very damaging. They're releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. 
we move on, we can see some of the after effects there. So on the left, it's just a general picture of the, the scorched bog habitat there. And then on the right, you can see a drain. So we've got a double whammy here. We have our drain peat, and then we have it burnt next to it. So we have the double impact on the water quality coming in there. And these pictures are in again, a couple of days later. And uh, Paul, who works on the CAM project, would have gone out and mapped this area here. And he would have provided the, that burn information to the consultants we're getting to do the wildfire management plan that will hopefully help reduce the severity of these fires on the on Steve Bay. And then this is just a picture. There was a big fire in 2017. And this is a picture of where the fire stopped. Um, you can see my feet there in, in the picture. And you can just see the level of burn. And this would have been, the fire was in May. That picture was taken in September. So you can see that the, it was burnt down to bare peat. Um, and, but there is regeneration coming quite quick. The header does come back if it's, if it's given the chance. But you still have a long period with just bare peat. And if you have heavy rain after that, that gets washed off the site. Like. So then lastly, these are the, the Dexter cattle. So um, I think those collars that are on the Dexter cattle were supplied by the River Blackwater Catchment Trust who uh, were involved in helping the farmer get the cattle up onto the site. And then that's up in above Nakatalan, up on the former Rossmore land now on, on Tashka's land. And they, hopefully these cattle will be going out again this year. And then there is involvement with the, the group water scheme or, uh, up in the area are very much involved in making sure the cattle are not going to be accessing any of the the, uh, the water course is there, which is very important from the human health point of view. And again, the River Blackwater Catchment Trust will be involved and the Hen Harrier project would have provided information on, um, on grazing and stocking densities. And then the CAM project too, we would have facilitated that. So that was just kind of a, a quick idea on some of the bigger stuff that um, the CAM project is doing. But I think, I suppose my message is that some of the rehabilitation stuff that can happen in bogs, especially some of the smaller lowland bogs, it's very simple. Um, not very difficult stuff and the skill set is here with Mary Catherine and Peter and Paddy and that skill set can be tapped into and, and readily accessed and re-wetting of, of, of little areas of wetland will do a huge amount. It helps to, to trap that carbon in, keep, keep, keep Monaghan's carbon local instead of sending it out around the world. Uh, right, thanks very much. Very good. Excellent Rory, great to see all that. Uh... Great work up at Sleep Bay. Um, so uh, that's great. Um, so next up, I think we're going to just uh, have a bit of a feedback session, if that's okay.